We'll go ahead and get started. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Candace Haddix. I'm from the class of 2015. Um, and I've been working on this nutrition project, trying to increase nutrition in our curriculum at USF. So I'm really just here to share some of what I learned. And I think it'll be really helpful for you all going into second year and beyond as you get more time in the clinic and time talking to patients. <clears throat> So the way we'll do it today is I'll start out with just a general overview of nutrition and then I'm going to be tying it into diabetes to give you a little bit of the clinical perspective and then Dr. Dean is going to come on after me after our break um, and she is a nutritionist in the area and she's very well versed in biochemistry and obviously nutrition and she has you know the clinical experience to bring into it so she'll be a great resource for us um, and if you have any questions I think she would be wonderful to answer them. So we'll go ahead and get started. Here are your learning objectives for future reference. Um, and then this is the outline. So like I said, I'll be going over um, an overview of nutrition. We'll start with prevalence data that pertains to diabetes and obesity. Um, and then I'll give you an overview of metabolic syndrome and show you how diabetes fits into that. Uh, we'll go into each of the components of nutrition, the major macronutrients like carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Uh, quickly touch on calories and then we'll tie it in with the diabetes. So starting with the introduction. Okay, so the Center for Disease Control and Prevention tracks a lot of diseases that are relevant to public obviously in the year 2000 and it's color coded and the colors indicate the prevalence of obesity in that state. So you can see that the majority of states are between 15 and 24 percent. So that was a big that was a big deal even for 2000 and they kind of noticed this trend happening over time where there was gradually increasing um, obesity. So back in 2000, um, Healthy People met and if you're not familiar with Healthy People, it's a program that's run by the Department of Health and Human Services and they basically set a list of objectives for the upcoming decade and these are objectives that the na for the nation to meet and most of them pertain or all of them pertain to health and disease. Uh, so they set a goal for the nation to reduce obesity down to 15 percent. So we'll look at 2010, uh, not one state met the objective and in fact most states increased, all but one state increased in the prevalence of obesity. And you can see that in 2010 this was uh, between 25 percent and up and uh, currently that is that 36 percent of adults are obese and 17 percent of children are obese in the U.S. Uh, and this has major implications for us as a nation financially. Um, it relates to $147 billion in medical costs each year. Um, so it's something that we all need to get engaged in. The reason, of course, that we care about obesity and overweight is because it relates to disease and it increases the risk of all of the things that you see here. And this is really the short list. Um, but I wanted to touch on a few because they relate to metabolic syndrome. Um, and those are high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes. So what metabolic syndrome is, is it's a constellation of findings in a patient, and there are five different criteria. You have abdominal obesity that's uh, measured by waist circumference, triglycerides above 150, um, low HDL cholesterol, high blood pressure above 130 over 85, and uh, elevated fasting blood glucose. And if you meet three out of the five criteria, then that's considered to be metabolic syndrome. The reason why we classify these patients and categorize them in metabolic syndrome is because compared to the healthy population, these patients are at an increased risk for coronary artery disease and diabetes. And we're going to be focusing on diabetes today. So you may have already had an overview of it, but I just wanted to go through it. Um, so a little bit of the pathophysiology of diabetes. Um, sources of blood glucose come from the liver, from gluconeogenesis, and you all have had general biochemistry, right? So you've been through all those pathways, so you remember that the liver can produce glucose on its own, um, and also the kidney does this to a lesser extent. Um, but then, of course, the major portion is from the diet, and carbohydrate that we eat gets ingested and absorbed in through the GI tract and enters the bloodstream. And in response to that, um, the beta cells will actually pick up that glucose and it sort of lets them know to secrete insulin. And the insulin will travel along with the glucose and we kind of 
I think classically explain this to patients to simplify it as like a lock and key mechanism that the insulin is really the key that opens the door for the glucose to enter the cell. Um, so, but for your purposes and for board exams and such, you should know a little bit more about the downstream signaling that goes on with, with insulin. So I just put a, a simplified cartoon here to show you. Um, and insulin will bind to its extracellular receptor and then that initiates a cascade of signaling, right? So you get phosphorylation of enzymes and such and eventually you activate the glycogen synthesis rate limiting step enzyme, which is glycogen synthase. So insulin, one of the things it does is it starts to build up the stores of glycogen. The other important thing is that it causes insertion of the GLUT4 receptor into the membrane and that's what allows the glucose to enter the cell. So what happens in diabetes is that you get, um, the, the insulin will actually become less potent. So it takes more and more of it to activate the receptor and initiate that cascade. Um, so what the pancreas will do is it'll start pumping out a lot of insulin to try to compensate and try to meet the demand. But of course it can't and eventually glucose will be building up in the bloodstream uh, and then that's where you get hyperglycemia. And when this goes on chronically for a long time, um, the pancreas kind of poops out and it starts produce, it stops producing insulin and that's why you see patients down the road with type 2 diabetes um, that are then on insulin because they need it exogenously. Their pancreas no longer is producing it. So, all right, so this is the text version of everything I just said. So just to recap, insulin receptor becomes less sensitive to the insulin that the pancreas is making. It'll then secrete more insulin to try to maintain glycemic control, but eventually the glucose will build up in the bloodstream. And then the really key thing here that I want you guys to take away from this, and again, this will be important for you, and I can kind of come to you from one year ahead to say that this is all over the board, so it's important to pay attention to this finding that um, the reason why we see things clinically is because there is non-enzymatic glycosylation. So that glucose, I like to think of it as it's kind of sticky and it'll just stick to other structures in the body. Um, and one of the things that it sticks to is blood vessels. So that's why you get blood vessel damage. Um, it'll also cause uh, dysregulation and water balance. It, you know, the glucose becomes like an osmotic factor. Um, and that will also lead to further damage. So the complications of diabetes are a lot. <laughs> so we'll start over on the left side here. Yeah. Um, the macrovesicular damage that occurs um, with the, your larger vessels will lead to cardiovascular complications um, and stroke. And then if you remember from last block, um, cardiovascular complications kind of go hand in hand with kidney damage and they kind of perpetuate each other, right? So you get this cycle of cardiovascular and kidney damage and that's why you see patients down the road on dialysis because their kidneys are totally shot. Um, and then the other thing is that smaller vessels are affected. And this can lead to retinal hemorrhage and that can cause blindness. And then because of the osmotic dysregulation, you can get lens damage and that will also lead to blindness. And then also um, poor wound healing from damage to those small vessels. Um, and kind of along with that, the nerves are damaged, so you get neuropathy, and that's why patients will often report loss of sensation in their extremities, um, and because of that loss of sensation, it predisposes them to getting really nasty infections. Um, so a lot of times we'll hear them report that, you know, they stepped on something, they didn't realize it, because uh, who checks the bottom of their feet constantly, um, and what happens is that really small prick in the bottom of their foot will eventually uh, become infected and they still will not be able to feel it. Um, and then that in combination with poor wound healing um, will, re will uh, result in a really nasty ulcer that often leads to amputation. So again, these are some of the complications. You can see that it's, um, it's pretty awful quality of life for somebody down the road with diabetes. So that's why today the goal is to is to help you um, help you help the patient really. Um, okay, so the um, diagnosis of diabetes, a lot of times it's asymptomatic for patients and they don't feel that their blood sugar is elevated and this can be kind of difficult because you have to convince them to change some of their habits and such um, and it's difficult to do that when they're not feeling any symptoms. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind. But oftentimes people will report 
needing to use the bathroom a lot, waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, um, excessively thirsty, loss of sensation in their extremities like we talked about earlier, and also blurred vision. Um, and the way we diagnose it is uh, first by looking at fasting blood sugar. So you've probably gotten a little bit of this from working at the health fairs, but uh, a healthy blood sugar is lower than 100. And then above 126 is diagnostic for diabetes. And then there's kind of the gray area in between 100 and 126 where we call that pre-diabetes, and those patients are, are at a much higher risk for developing diabetes. <clears throat> and then also what correlates with the blood sugar is HbA1c, and that stands for hemoglobin A1c, and it kind of relates to what I was talking about earlier, the non-enzymatic glycosylation, um, and that happens specifically to the hemoglobin as well. And we can measure this in the bloodstream and uh, get a percentage of the uh, amount of glycosylated hemoglobin in the bloodstream. And the little meter to your right uh, kind of shows you how that relates to blood sugar. And the cutoff for diabetes for HbA1c are 6.5% and up. Uh, healthy is below 5.7, and then 5.7 to 6.4 is the prediabetes range. Um, and as you get higher in the HbA1c scale and as you get more blood glucose uh, built up, then uh, that greatly increases the risk of complication. So that's why you, um, you want to help these patients con control their blood sugar. Okay, so a little bit more on the prevalence of diabetes um, for your knowledge, but really, as I said earlier, this is about empowering your patient and helping them to prevent a lot of these complications. Um, and what we're trying to tell you about today is nutrition, and this is a very important aspect, as, as you'll see as we go through. Um, and this is something that not a lot of physicians are doing currently. Uh, there was a paper out recently that showed only 36% of residents and fellows are counseling their patients on diet, um, and a lot of them reported that it was because of inadequate training. So this is our chance to, to train you to go into the clinic then and, and to teach your patients about nutrition. Okay, so we'll start with a clinical case. We have Stacy Adams, who's 32, and she's coming to your clinic um, just for uh, uh, her annual checkup. She has some concerns about diabetes because she has a uh, family history of it, um, and also she's slightly overweight. As you can see, her BMI is 26, and a healthy BMI is between 18 and 25. <clears throat> um, so you, you decide to do a... Uh, to check her blood sugar just to see how she's doing because she has these concerns and maybe some things came up in review of systems. Um, so bef uh, before she comes back, you get the results, and her blood glucose is at 119. And if you remember, less than 100 is considered normal for fasting blood glucose, and above 126 is diagnostic for diabetes. So she fits in that prediabetes kind of gray area. Um, so what I want you to think about as we go through the slides on nutrition is what are you going to tell her and how are you going to, you know, make recommendations for her and that kind of thing. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we go through and then we'll come back to this at the end. Okay, so that was the introduction. Now we'll go, go ahead with the uh, nutrition and we'll start with carbohydrate. So you have two basic types of carbohydrates in food. Um, there are the simple sugars, which are your mono and disaccharides. Uh, fructose, sucrose, and you can see sucrose is pictured there. Um, the complex sugars are the starches, as we say, um, and these are the more branched molecules. Uh, cellulose is pictured. This is also where dietary fiber fits in. Um, and these the carbohydrates in general have a direct effect on blood glucose. So after you eat them, they're absorbed into the bloodstream directly. Um, fiber, however, is not absorbed, so just keep that in mind. Fiber is not going to affect blood sugar because it's not absorbed. Okay, so how much carbohydrate do we get in our diet and how much is recommended for somebody with type 2 diabetes? So for most people, uh, 45 to 65% of t total caloric intake comes from carbohydrate. And this amounts to approximately 225 to 325 grams of carbs each day. <clears throat> the minimum, just for your reference, the minimum to maintain uh, brain function is about 130 grams. So that should give you a little bit of perspective on how much is like the bare minimum that we need. 
Um, but most people get between 325, about between 225 and 325. The recommended amount of fiber is 28 grams per day. And as I mentioned, fiber is not absorbed. And it's important to keep in mind, because it's not absorbed, it makes its way down to the colon. Um, and that's where colonic bacteria can break it down. And in their metabolic processes, they release gas. And that's what causes cramping. And that's really uncomfortable for patients if they're not used to fiber in the diet. So when you're making recommendations on fiber, and it's important to do so because of the cardiovascular, cardiovascular implications, um, but as you're making recommendations um, and you find a patient who is not consuming much fiber, it's important to tell them to increase it slowly over time because the side effects of you know, being really gassy and crampy and everything may discourage them. Um, okay, so then for somebody with diabetes, um, you want to recommend about 45 grams per meal to start with. This is sort of the, you know, per guideline, and then you kind of play with this number as you see their blood sugars. So what you, the goal for their blood sugars to be less than 140 preprandial, which means fasting, and then less than 180 postprandial, which is uh, two hours after a meal. Um, so you want to get those numbers from them and then adjust their carbs accordingly. Okay, and then carb counting. Um, this is an important topic for people because if you're recommending 45 carbs per meal, for a lot of people that's going to be overwhelming and they're not going to want to sit there and count out their carbohydrates. I think for, for some people, probably people like us <laughs> who are rigorous and like numbers and such, um, I think that carb counting could be something that you know we could do, but for most people it's kind of exhausting. So the better way to go is to um, have people estimate their carbs and the way that the American Diabetes Association and a lot of the diabetic cookbooks out there have done this is they use carb choices. So one carb choice is equivalent to 15 grams. So to get you know the 45 grams in a meal, you would just choose three carb choices and then um, adjust from there depending on how the blood glucose goes. So just to give you an idea of some carb choices, one medium-sized piece of fruit like the orange is about 15 grams. Um, one cup of milk is about 15 grams. So you can kind of get familiar with these popular carb choices and then choose three for a meal. Um, and that seems to work for a lot of folks. Okay, and for the rigid people who do like the numbers, I wanted to touch on glycemic index and glycemic load. These are things that you may hear your patients talking about, so I just wanted to give you an idea of what they were. Glycemic index is a measure of how much blood sugar will increase two hours after a meal of, you know, the item that it's indicating for. So, for example, um, white rice has a glycemic index value of 73, so it's projected that two hours after the meal, the uh, blood sugar will increase by that amount. 70 and above is considered high on the glycemic index, and... Um, I think I have it written down on your PowerPoint, but I think 55, less than 55 is considered low. Uh, so the lower the number, the lower it's going to affect the blood sugar. And this is um, great for, I think, substituting. So if you want a better option than white rice, you can maybe go for couscous because it's lower on the glycemic index. For glycemic load, it's pretty much the same thing as glycemic index, except it takes into account the serving size. And um, I pulled out a few examples to show you um, the implications of that. Uh, carrots and blueberries, as you can see, are well above 70 on the glycemic index. So on the glycemic index, they would be considered to have a high, uh, they would be considered to have high glycemic index. The glycemic load, however, it's a different scale. So 20 and above is considered high and 10 and below is considered low. So you can see that on the glycemic load, they're low. And the reason is because the glycemic load takes into account serving size. So a reasonable person, when they sit down to eat berries and carrots, they're not going to have, like, you know, a whole plateful. So um, with that taken into account, it lowers the value. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Okay, pop quiz. Um, these aren't in turning points, so just kind of talk amongst yourselves. Uh, how much carbohydrate would be absorbed based on the information on the nutrition label? So I'll give you a few seconds to talk it over. If anyone has the answer and would like to shout it out, throw it at me.
Anyone bold this morning? All right, well, I'll just take you through it. Total carbs is 18. So then to find the amount absorbed, you would subtract the dietary fiber, right, because that's not absorbed, so it doesn't contribute. Um, so that brings you down to 16. And then sugar alcohol, I didn't tell you this. I thought we could learn from the example. Uh, sugar alcohol is partially absorbed. So, you know, usually a factor in about half of whatever it says there. So if there are 12 grams of sugar alcohol in this item, then... Uh, you can think maybe about six would get absorbed, so it brings it down to 10 grams, which is letter C. Anyone, anyone come up with it? All right, you guys are half asleep. That's okay. All right, moving on to protein. Essential for amino acid turnover. This is why we need protein in our diet to replace amino acids that are broken down. Um, it has little to no immediate impact on blood glucose, so that's important if you're considering uh, diabetes, but it does still contribute to calories, right? Each gram of protein is worth about four calories, um, so you want to monitor it for those reasons, uh, to not overeat. Um, and the recommendation is about 50 to 70 grams of protein per day, uh, but this will vary widely depending on the person that's sitting in front of you. So. You know, if they're a large person or a small person or a very active person or somebody who does bodybuilding, then their protein needs are going to be very different. Um, and the better calculation is to do 0 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram per day. Okay, for, just like for carb estimating, there's protein estimating. Um, so a 3-ounce serving of cooked meat is about 21 grams of protein. And the serving size that that should relate to is about the size of a computer mouse. Um, for fish, they say it's about a deck of cards or so. Um, so that should help your patients recognize the portion sizes that they should be eating in a meal. Um, and then the fist approximates one cup. Of course, it depends on your fist, and my fist may be different from your fist, but it's a good approximation. Um, and just for your reference, um, a half a cup of peas or beans or lentils is about seven grams of protein. And remember, you can get... Um, protein from other sources like yogurt and things so it doesn't have to come from meat I just wanted to point that out um, and also remember with the peas and beans that they contain carbohydrate as well so you gotta factor that into the carb counting um, okay so the take home for protein is you wanna have two to three meats a day because that'll get you to around 50 the 50 to 70 range um, and then, or the equivalent of beans and yogurt. And it does not directly impact blood sugar, but it still contributes to caloric intake, so it should still be something that's monitored. Okay, moving on to fats. Okay, so fats kind of get a bad rep, but we have to remember that they are important for the synthesis of phospholipids, prostaglandins, and also uh, many hormones in the body. Um, <clears throat> we get them uh, from just de novo lipogenesis, but also obviously a big source comes from the diet. Um, and the essential fats that we need to get in our diet are linoleic acid and alpha linolenic acid. Um, and then just uh, going back to why fat is monitored strictly, it's because it's been unequivocally linked to insulin resistance and production of cytokines. So it's definitely something that you want to pay attention to and tell your patients to pay attention to. Um, and we'll go through a few things that they can look out for. Uh, the recommendation for fat, total fat is 60 grams, saturated fat is 16 grams, cholesterol 300 milligrams, and then trans fat is zero. And we will talk about that when I get to the slide on trans fat. Um, and then of the macronutrients, fat is the most calorie dense. So I mentioned earlier protein is about four calories per gram of protein. Carbohydrates, the same thing, four calories per gram of carbohydrate. But fat is nine calories per gram, so it's the one that's the most dense. <clears throat> okay, for unsaturated fats, these are found mostly in vegetable products, and they come in two varieties. You have polyunsaturated fat, and those are typically found in mayonnaise, salad dressing, vegetable oils, things like that. Monounsaturated fat, this one is considered one of the more healthier fats, um, and you can find that in avocado, olive oil, and peanut butter. And for estimating a serving size of fat, um, there's the thumb and walnut. So the thumb is about this uh, equivalent to a teaspoon, and then the walnut is about equivalent to uh, two tablespoons. 
Okay, for saturated fat, these are found mostly in animal products, so beef, bacon, cream, butter, and shortening. Um, there are a few plant products that contain saturated fats, and those include palm oil and cocoa butter. The recommendation for saturated fat is to keep it minimum, but two to three servings a day max. Um, and then the suggestion is to eat leaner meats and remove the skin from the poultry. Um, and then again, tips for estimating, use the thumb and walnut idea to estimate how much, uh, how much is taking in. And I think that this is important for patients um, to help them with estimating because, you know, when you get that baked potato and you start putting the sour cream on, being able to visualize the walnut and then know, like, how much you're actually putting on is important. Um, and same thing with butter and other fats. For cholesterol, um, cholesterol is produced in the body, and for us, we have two sources of cholesterol, obviously the diet, but really the bigger offender is the liver, and the liver is really the main source of, carbo or of uh, cholesterol. Um, so, so this is mostly what contributes to hyperlipidemia, but it's still important to control it in the diet. Um, so the the recommendation for cholesterol is 300 milligrams or less per day. Um, and just to give you an idea, uh, one egg contains about 185 milligrams of cholesterol, and one, uh, one three-ounce serving of beef contains about 60. And, of course, this will vary depending on the cut of meat and how you trim it up and stuff. Um, so just keep that in mind. Okay, on to trans fats. Trans fats, the, um, the American Heart Association has come out and said that there is no safe amount of trans fats in food and in the diet and really doesn't play a part in our nutrition. So it's really important to limit these. Um, there are a few natural sources of trans fat um, that I was reading about, like there's some found in pork, um, and there's some evidence that naturally derived trans fat is healthier than synthetically produced trans fat, but there's very little evidence on it and there's no consensus on that yet. So the recommendation is still zero trans fats. Um, but the, for the most part, we find trans fat in partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. And these have ideal baking properties. They're cheap to manufacture. They're also you know, serving as a preservative. So a lot of manufacturers like to use these oils. And the problem is that I think 45% and up of the oil is consisting of trans fat. Um, and trans fat has been linked to vascular inflammation and endothelial dysfunction, which are both involved in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. So that's why it's important to very much limit these fats, or rather eliminate these fats from the diet. Um, they're also a significant predictor of high LDL cholesterol, and that also contributes to atherosclerosis. Okay, so another quick question here. Um, again, not in turning point, so just kind of talk it out amongst yourselves. But Stacy wants to know if some fats are preferred over the others. So what will you tell her? Okay. The answer, if you haven't gotten it already, is D. The fat should be limited in the diet, but unsaturated fats from vegetables and nuts are better than saturated and trans fats. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okie dokie. Okay, moving on to calories. Um, <clears throat> historically, it's kind of been taught that calorie in versus calorie out, you know, the more more calories that, if, or if you burn more calories than you take in, then you lose weight, and if you go the other way, then you gain weight. And this is really too simple. Um, and I love a paper that recently came out, I think in 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed that it's actually more about the types of food. So where you get those calories from is more important than simply how much uh, is spent over or taken in. Um, and I referenced uh, the paper in the notes of your slide, so if you want to take a look at the paper, it's really interesting. Um, and uh, really, uh, it's important to know that calorie intake should depend on age, gender, and metabolic needs. I think on the nutrition labels, you often see the 2,000 calorie diet. Well, the 2,000 calorie diet is not ideal for everyone, and people have different caloric needs. Um, and in general, women will need fewer calories than men, and younger people will need fewer, sorry, younger people need more calories than older people. 
Um, so it's important to, again, consider the person in front of you and think about their needs. And also activity level is really, really important. If they're a triathlete, if they're part of the tri -docs, then, you know, they're going to need more calories. So, um, so just be considerate of how much you think they need. <clears throat> um, and just to give you a demonstration in how calories w relates to weight loss, um, one pound is about equivalent to 3,500 calories. And it's pretty reasonable for a patient who's trying to lose weight to lose about a pound a week. And that's usually what I've seen recommended in the clinic is about a pound a week. So if this is solely from the diet, the 3,500 calories spread over the week is equivalent to about a 500 calorie deficit per day. And this is, you know, a little bit of an idealized example because, you know, the numbers don't always work for everyone, but that's a, just to give you an idea, 500 calorie deficit per day. So that's a lot to just come from the diet. It's a lot to cut out of the diet. It's a lot to do by exercise alone. That would mean like an hour of hardcore cycling in the gym to burn that many calories, and not everyone's up for that every day. So the best thing to recommend is to do the dual approach of exercise and taking calories out of the diet, um, and that will really be more reasonable for people that are trying to lose weight. Okay, and cutting calories out of the diet um, might be easy if there are a lot of excessive calories. Um, and for the past 30 years, we've seen a huge rise in the amount of sugar-sweetened beverages um, so the intake of these has increased about threefold, and it's estimated that 10% of our daily calorie intake is from things like sodas and Red Bulls and things like that. So um, this greater intake has been related to higher risk for type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. So it's important to also ask your patients not only what they're eating, but what they're drinking, um, because that typically tends to be a big offender. And I put a few notes at the bottom for um, how much carbohydrate is in one can of soda. And you can see for someone with diabetes, a can of soda is almost equivalent to their carb load per meal. Remember the 45 grams of carbohydrate per meal. If they have a soda with lunch, they're taking in 39 grams of carbohydrate, and that really doesn't leave them much to get from other healthier sources. Um, so that's why it's important to ask them about drinks and kind of counsel them on, on cutting back on those excessive calories. Uh, we don't have time to go through all the micronutrients, but I wanted to list them here. They should all look familiar to you since uh, you've just been through the biochemistry, and these are your cofactors and enzymes and such. <clears throat> um, so these are also important to get in the diet, um, and they mostly come from whole foods that, that haven't been processed. And if you look at, like, white bread compared to a whole grain bread, um, they're often missing a lot of the micronutrients, and they have to be either enriched by adding them back in um, so it's really better to get these from, from whole foods. Um, and, and then just at the bottom, the antioxidants and phytochemicals, um, a lot of these are currently unclassified, and we don't really understand a lot of the molecules that are, that are in whole foods and stuff, but they seem to be doing great things. So it's just, I just wanted to point it out to pique your interest and uh, be on the lookout for data on phytochemicals and how it can relate to health. All right, here is a summary of all the slides and the Hopefully, sorry about that red line. I don't know how to get rid of that. Okay, we'll leave it there. Um, so the summary of the recommendations from all the previous slides, um, and hopefully you can reference this when you're in the clinic and counseling people on nutrition. Um, the calories will really depend on the age and gender, but roughly 1,800 to 2,200 is the range that you're playing with. Um, carbohydrates three carb choices, which is equivalent to about 45 grams. And this is, again, for somebody with diabetes. So this is the recommendation that you start them with, and then you kind of look at how their blood sugar goes, and you will make adjustments based on that. Um, for fiber, the recommendation from um, the American Heart Association is 28 grams per day, which is hard to obtain if you're not used to that much fiber in the diet. So again, recommending building it slowly. Um, and they also say 50% of carbohydrates should be from whole grains, and that will give you a lot of those micronutrients. Protein, 50 to 70 grams. Fat, um, 50 to 80 grams. Limited saturated fat, and totally eliminate trans fats. Limit sugar-sweetened beverages. And we haven't talked about alcohol. I think I put a few slides at the end for your reference. Um, but the recommendation is a maximum of one drink per day for women and two, two drinks per day for men. And again, this will depend on the person and how they handle the alcohol. Um, it becomes important in diabetes because 
uh, consuming alcohol can actually drop their blood sugar, so that's important uh, to make them aware of what symptoms they may be feeling when their blood sugar gets too low. Um, but yeah, alcohol is another topic. If you have any questions, you can uh, ask me or ask Dr. Dean or look at some of the references that I put um, at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so lastly, we'll wrap it up with how it all relates to diabetes. Um, so with achieving glycemic control, there was a, a study done in 2002 that really kind of paved the way for the lifestyle modification aspect of treating diabetes. Um, so what they did was they had 3,200 patients that were pre-diabetic. So if you remember, these are the people between 100 and 126 fasting blood, blood sugar. Um, and these are patients that are at risk for developing diabetes. So they randomly assigned them to three different groups. Um, there was one group with no intervention. There was one group with uh, medication alone. And the medication that um, you'll hear about next year is metformin. This is uh, one of the first drugs that we go to in the treatment of diabetes. And, um, and then the last group was lifestyle modification. Um, and what that entailed was 7% weight loss through diet and exercise and increasing vegetables and fruits in the diet and those kinds of things. Um, so what they did is after 2.8 years, that was about the follow-up time, they looked back at, at each group and they looked at what percentage went on to develop diabetes. And you can see in the red boxes, um, those are, that's the outcome that they measured. So the lifestyle modification group had the lowest uh, progression to diabetes. And as I said, this has really uh, framed the suggestions for treating patients with prediabetes and that you don't have to go straight to medication, um, but there is something that you can do, and it actually happens to be the most effective, and that is uh, lifestyle modification. A little bit of weight loss, you know, um, fixing up the, uh, the diet and then recommending exercise. Uh, so this is important to keep in mind. And if you remember back to Stacy, and she was concerned she has, uh, she fits into this category of prediabetes um, and is looking for recommendations. So I have a multiple choice question, but I think it's pretty obvious because we just went through all this. Uh, the answer is going to be C, that you would counsel her on identifying ways to improve her diet and reduce her weight by about 5%, which is a reasonable amount for patients to lose when they're just starting off, um, and then follow up in, in three months and repeat labs. Um, and we'll go through kind of the counseling approach on the very last slide, which is coming up soon, um, so that you kind of know how, to, how the discussion will go. <clears throat> okay, so there really is no ideal diabetes diet that's been like nailed down in the guidelines and, and suggested. It really, all of the different, the American Heart Association and diabetes, they kind of pull recommendations from each other. And there are a few general principles that you want to follow. Obviously, first for glycemic control is to limit carbohydrate in the diet, and you make adjustments based on how the patient's blood sugar is. Um, and having them keep a log is really ideal, so you have them check their blood sugar when they first wake up in the morning and then two hours after a meal. And if you get that for a few days, then you kind of have a good idea of how their diet is and then also how they're doing overnight. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the liver will pump out some sugar through gluconeogenesis, so, uh, so it's important to consider their fasting blood sugar too. <clears throat> um, then the, the next thing is to increase fiber for extra cardiovascular protection. This tends to lower cholesterol and leads to uh, lower incidence of cardiovascular outcomes uh, or poor cardiovascular outcomes, so that's something to consider recommending to them. Um, and then watch portion sizes. I had a um, nutritionist who recommended actually keeping measuring cups in the office so that you can show people, like, this is how much half a cup is. And it's sometimes, you know, sometimes we lose sight of how much that is. And when you go to eat the ice cream, you just, like, scoop and scoop and scoop. But half a cup is the serving size on the carton, and it's actually pretty small. So being able to show your patients how much that is, um, I think, is, is a good uh, way to demonstrate to them to watch their portion sizes. Um, and then obtaining micronutrients that we talked about from whole foods rather than processed foods. Okay, so treating diabetes is really a multi-therapeutic approach. It's not just nutrition. It's not just medicine. I hope that this has kind of been clear as we've been going through. Um, so you want to, when you meet with your patients, you want to discuss their medication adherence, see what, it's hard to take medicine daily, and it's hard to watch blood sugars and stuff. 
Um, so I think talking to them about some of their barriers and, and some of the things that make it difficult for them to be adherent with their medicine is important. Um, you want to encourage them to do exercise. And then the other main thing that we haven't touched on yet is stress, something that we can all relate to. Um, but when you're stressed, your body releases cortisol, and then that can actually trigger gluconeogenesis. So you can see how for someone with diabetes who, um, you know, has insulin insensitivity, it's very important to control stress. And the other thing that happens when you're stressed is norepinephrine is released, and this can actually reduce insulin secretion, and that can lead to hyperglycemia as well. Um, so encouraging stress management is important. And then sleep. Sleep is very important as well. So I want you to think about when you're talking to patients that have diabetes, considering all these aspects of their care is very important. Um, okay, and then the counseling approach can be uh, first to review the labs that come in. Um, so in the case of Stacy, you would want to sit down with her and explain what the 119 means, explain what the goals are, and then talk to them about their concerns. Um, and then when you initiate the discussion on diet, you always want to start by asking them what they typically eat. And get specific. Don't just say, you know, how's your diet? Because they're going to say, eh, it's kind of bad or <laughs> it's kind of good. So you want to ask them specifically, what do you eat for breakfast? What do you eat for lunch? Um, what's a typical snack? What kinds of drinks do you like to drink? Those kinds of things. Because that is all important when you're going to suggest modification. So you want to target, you know, maybe for breakfast they they eat, um, you know, like three eggs and a piece of toast and then orange juice and coffee. So then you want to, like, target a few of those. Say maybe replace one of the pieces of toast with an orange or something like that and think about how you can um, make small recommendations and be reasonable. And part of being reasonable is going to be considering what they're already eating and what they like to eat. Um, so just giving them brochures on healthy diets and recipes is uh, sometimes not going to be as effective because if they don't like to eat those things, then they're not going to. Um, and then the last thing that I, I think is a good recommendation is to have them identify two to three goals um, that they're going to do between that time and the time when, you, when they come in for follow-up. Um, so these goals can be about sleep, they can be about exercise, you know, maybe they, uh, they'll agree to walk 15 minutes after dinner each night, or maybe they'll agree to switch out that you know, piece of white bread in the morning for an orange or start eating breakfast or, you know, all these things. So you want to have them name two to three goals um, and then document them when you're writing up your notes and you're writing up your plan so that you can reference it when the patient comes back in and you can read it and say, hey, how's it been going with, you know, walking after dinner? Have you been able to do that or has it been tough? You know, and then um, that kind of lets them know that you're on board with their care and they'll respect you more for it and they'll tend to listen to you more in the future when you make recommendations. Um, and I think in general, them knowing that you're engaged will make them more compliant. Okay, so I think that's my last slide. Um, and just to go through the, these are just for you guys to look at later. I put a bunch of carb choices in there if you're interested. I think it's a good idea to get familiar with some of these. Um, and then um, a little bit on alcohol. And maybe this is where I put the reference for alcohol. And then you can see... Uh, how it all comes together in a sample meal, and then lastly, just a few tips for counseling in the clinic. Most of these we've already talked about. Um, any questions? Oh, there are questions. All right. You mentioned encouraging uh, patients to eat breakfast. Is is there anything other than that that's like time specific for meals? Like you'd want to encourage like not eating after a certain hour, and why? Um, probably Dr. Dean would be better at because she's had more experience in the clinic counseling. Um, do you have any comments? I, the microphone works if you hold down the button as you're talking. No. Can you hear me now? Okay. So your question was related to um, eating after a certain hour or not eating after a certain hour? Well, that's going to really depend on every uh, each individual. People work on different shifts, but generally speaking, and it's something that I'll briefly get into, it's always going to be a better idea to eat smaller, more frequent meals. Um, the recommendation to not eat after a certain hour is generally, is really only because most people like just eat too much too late. But at the end of the day, it really does boil down to your total caloric intake. Naturally, the quality of the calories count, but um, it's not... 
it's not a hard and fast rule that you have to stop eating after a certain hour. It's really just because most people just eat too much too late. Um, I'll be getting into a little bit more of that uh, in my presentation, but that's a good question.